Amen. And glad that you are here. I know that all of us have probably been watching the events of the last few days uh, over in the Middle East unfold on our devices or TV and all that's going on over there where Hamas, Palestine, which is a governed by Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, has attacked Israel. And they are at war now. This is not just a military event, but it is war. And so a lot of people are asking, well, what does this mean? And what are we to think about this? And uh, is this the beginning of the end? Maybe. Uh, is this the beginning of World War III? Maybe. Uh, is this the last days? Definitely. Definitely. In fact, we have been living in the last days for quite some time. We are actually in the last of the last days. And so there are all types of conspiracy theories that are out there. There are a lot of people that are using whatever social platform they have to all of a sudden be an expert. Some know what they're talking about. Most do not. Some are, are, are just saying what they think, trying to connect the dots, but they don't know. I don't think anyone knows for sure what's going on. But I do know this, that Jesus said this. Jesus said these things must happen. And so we understand this is a part of history. I don't know where this plays out in the plan of God. As I said, it could be a lot of things. I'm just cautioning people to not believe everything that you hear and certainly not believe everything that you read on social media. There are going to be a lot of uh, people that are trying to rewrite history, the history of Palestine, the history of Israel, and confuse that. But Israel is the promised land. This is the land that God has promised them. And it has been theirs, and, and they are there. Palestine has not been a nation longer than Israel, any longer than Israel has. And, uh, and this organization does not want peace. They do not want Israel to exist. They've been opportunity after opportunity to have peace with Israel, but they want their annihilation. And so, uh, again, Jesus said these things must come to pass. So our viewpoint as believers is, well, bring it on. If this is what it takes to uh, set up the rapture, if this is what it takes to bring back Jesus, then we understand we can't prevent this. And so we understand it's going to happen. These things have been prophesied. So we, we embrace that. We do, however, continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for innocent life that it's not be lost on either side. Uh, we, that's what we want, and we, regardless of what we see, we have the responsibility to pray. And so I want to ask you, would you join me for just a moment as we just take a moment as a church to pray for the events that we're seeing and that we will continue to see for quite some time uh, as this war begins to escalate. So, Father, we take a moment today that even though we don't know the answers, Father, we know what you've commissioned us and called us to do, which is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And God, we begin to pray for that. We pray for innocent lives, Father. We pray for protection. And Father, we pray because we know that there's a very real enemy that's moving on the face of the earth. And Father, we, we pray for Jerusalem to be protected. We pray for the plan of God, the prophetic plan of God to be played out. And God, I thank you that we are free from worry. We refuse to worry. We refuse to operate in fear. But we're going to trust you, Father, even as we see these events unfold, even as we see these things escalate, we keep our trust on you. We don't put our eyes on what's happening, Father. We are aware. But ultimately, our trust is in you. Our faith is in you. Father, again, we lift up this situation. We pray for those involved, and we pray for the peace of God to be in, in this city, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So again, there are a lot of questions, and, and uh, whatever you hear, whatever you read, check it out for yourself. Make sure it lines up with Scripture. There are a few um, reliable voices that are out there, and so find some that are and, and uh, connect with those to kind of keep you informed how things are going, all right? But I want to take a few moments that we have together today and talk about a message that God put on my heart a couple of weeks ago that I simply entitled, Valleys Before Victories. And I like the name of that. I like the title of this message, and here's why. Because all of us walk through valleys. This is something that every one of us sitting here can relate to. 
or that every one of us have gone through. We have all walked through valleys. We have all gone through difficult times. No one is immune from difficult times, from trials, and from circumstances. But keep in mind that you have to go through the valley in order to get to the mountaintop. There's no other way. So the valley isn't the destination. The valley isn't the end game. It's just a road to the mountaintop. And so we have to understand that. And hopefully by understanding that, it gives you a new perspective of your circumstances. That that this is the road to blessing. This is the way out of my situation. David wrote these words. In the 23rd Psalm, David wrote the words, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We remember that and, and we relate to that. But if you read the rest of the psalm, he went on to say at the end of the psalm that my cup runs over. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God is preparing a table for me, and I will dwell in the presence of the Lord. He started in the valley, but he ended on the mountaintop. So again, we don't stay in the valley. We just travel through the valley. He had to walk through the valley in order to get to the blessing. In fact, I've often said it this way, is that sometimes you have to go through some things in order to get to some things. And maybe a little bit of a better way to say that is that sometimes you have to grow through some things in order to get to some things. Because we know that if we go through the valley, we go through the storm, we know we're going to learn a lesson, right? We may be learning it the hard way. God may have wanted to show us an easier way to get through this. But whatever it is you're going through, learn the lesson that God wants you to learn, right? Don't make another trip around that mountain. So ultimately, it's good news. And so I would just say from a pastor's chair, from a pastor's viewpoint today, if you're going through the valley, if you're facing an addiction, if you're going through a divorce, if you're going through financial setback, if you're hurt, if you're lonely, if you're broken, if if you're messed up, the good news is you're just in a valley. That's not the end game. You're going through the valley, but the ultimate goal is to reach the mountaintop. So as a church, that's very liberating to to understand the fact that we don't pretend that these things don't exist, that people don't have problems and issues, because we know the truth. In fact, statistically speaking, the church is as messed up as the world. The addiction rate, the divorce rate, the debt rate is the same in the church as it is in the world. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just saying statistically speaking, that's what it is. And so we are not as a church going to sweep things under the rug. And the reason we don't sweep things under the rug is because we don't need to. It's because we have a Lord, we have Jesus, we have a healer, we have a deliverer, we have a miracle worker. And so we don't have to hide these things. We just have to be willing to bring them to Christ and to bring them to him for healing in our lives. So it's okay to bring your baggage to church. It's okay to bring your problems to church because we want to be a real church for real people. In fact, let me say it this way. I'm not the first one to say this, but let me, let me add it to what others have said, is that church is a hospital for the hurting, not a country club for the spiritual elite. In fact, Dr. Jesus said it this way, it's not the well that need a physician. It's those that are hurting. It's those that are sick. And so it's okay to be broken and be in church. So church is for messed up people, amen? Are there any messed up people in the house? Come on, how many know we all are? We, we, all, we all are messed up a little bit. And so just understand that. We, we had a speaker that spoke to our group of men at man school last Monday night, and, and he, he made this subject. He said, every one of us men are in one of three places, one that we are about to, we, we are in a desert place. He said, either you are in a desert place, or you just came out of a desert place, or you're about to go into a desert place. So we understand that. So I want to take a moment today, and I want to focus on what does the desert look like? First of all, understand this. The desert, a desert place is where you feel the heat. It's uncomfortable. And you know that that something is going on. You know this is not where I want to stay, but I understand that my my circumstances, that, that maybe God is moving through those because a desert place is a place of separation. It is a dry place. 
And, and we know that we, I think, as, I think that it is one of the places that we really begin to sense our hunger for God. But it is also a place of reflection where we begin to search our hearts. In fact, I would even go as far as to say it is a place of preparation. So I don't want you to have the mindset that if you're in a desert place, you're not being punished. God may be preparing you for the next step of your life. So we are in a battle, amen? And we talked, the last couple of weeks, we talked about what is a spiritual awakening. Because I believe that not only us as a church, but I believe the big church, right, with the capital C, the worldwide church, that God is calling us to a spiritual awakening. Now, when you hear the word spiritual awakening, it doesn't always mean revival. It doesn't always mean the presence of God. It doesn't always mean the glory of God, the anointing. Sometimes a spiritual awakening is a wake-up call to spiritual warfare. And I think what we see happening today, we realize that we need to pray because there is a battle between good and evil that is being fought, even behind the scenes. And so... The Bible uses a lot of terminology about spiritual warfare. In fact, here's just a few of them. We're told in the word of God to fight the good fight of faith. We're told that the violent take the kingdom of God by force. We're told to put on the whole armor of God. How many of you know you don't wear an armor to a church picnic? So it's not all fun and games. Take the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And so all of these things that we are hearing that we know is that there is, a, there is an aspect of our spiritual life that we are called to enter into spiritual warfare to do battle and to prevail in that battle. In fact, there's a great example from the Bible. One of my favorite, of course, is when David faces Goliath. Now, does anybody, anybody want to venture or take a guess about where did David fight Goliath? In the valley, right? But it was important that David fight Goliath because that's what ultimately propelled him to the throne. So God put a Goliath in his path in order to lift up his own name and exalt the name of God and to propel David to the throne. Now, let me give you the bullet points about Goliath because I want, I, sometimes we just gloss over that and we don't really get what he was up against. Goliath was about 11 foot, four inches tall. That's a big dude. He weighed probably somewhere around 500 pounds. Um, the armor that he wore weighed 200 pounds and, and the, the, the head of the spear, the spearhead weighed 23 pounds. So everything about him was large and in charge, right? And if you've ever wondered, well, 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 why did David pick up five stones? He only used one against Goliath. It's because Goliath had four brothers just like him. David came prepared to clean house. He wasn't just looking for a victory. He was looking for total victory. Now, when I break down Goliath and show you what David was up against, how, how many of you honestly just thought you had problems, Right? Nobody's facing an 11 foot, four inch, 500 pound giant today, but it doesn't mean that giants don't exist. In fact, there are spiritual giants that we face. There, there may be people here today that, that the problems in your life can be just as large and, and as intimidating as a giant is. Some people are facing financial giants. And it literally feels that way. How am I ever going to get out of debt? I'm living paycheck to paycheck. How, how do I break free from this? How, how, do I, how do I reestablish myself? And that debt, that financial giant stands in front of you. For others, it, it may be an emotional giant. Sometimes people just can't get past their past. They're, they're hung up on, on mistakes that they've made, uh, loss of a loved one, a loneliness, separation, whatever. And so there are all of these emotions that are in their past. And, and, and then there are these what I call physical giants. Maybe you've got a, an illness in your life. Maybe there's a physical addiction that you're dealing with or something that's going on. But one of the things that would happen was that every day Goliath would show up at the camp. Every day, Goliath, the Bible says, would walk across the valley, stand at the, the line of the Israels, Israelites, and he would begin to taunt them. And he would make fun of their God. 
He would make fun of how small their God was. He would call them cowards and dogs and all of these things. And so, and the first thing happened in the morning when they woke up, they would hear this giant's voice in their head. So I know there are even what we would call mental giants. This thought that you deal with, and first thing you wake up in the morning, whether it's worry or fear or, or whatever, you hear the voice of your problem in your head. In fact, you may find this interesting. The word demon itself means one who operates through the mind. So we know that demonic activity, part of demonic activity is to attack your mind. I think we all would agree there is a battle for our mind because if you think wrong, you believe wrong. And so there is a battle going on in our mind to get us to think wrong, to get us to doubt, to get us to live in fear, rather than to focus on the Word of God. And so the Bible talks a great deal about renewing your mind, capturing your thoughts, controlling your thoughts, because it is part of spiritual warfare. And I just, again, I always like to say this when I talk anything about demons. Let me just say that a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. But it doesn't mean that a demon cannot mess with your head. They can torment, confuse, intimidate, and distract. So understand that spiritual warfare is real. My point is this, though. Giants always position themselves between us and our breakthrough. So you're going to have to deal with it. In Matthew chapter 6, and this is a part of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prayed this, you know, our Father which art in heaven. But part of that prayer, in that prayer, he prayed, he says that when you pray, teaching disciples to pray, he said, don't forget to pray this, deliver us from evil. There is evil in the world. We live in a broken world. And one of the things that we need to pray on a daily basis is God help us to navigate through this world and deliver us from the evil that is in this world. Remember that Jesus had a one-on-one battle with Satan where? In the wilderness. He was 40 days in the wilderness, and there were three major temptations that came to him. Each one of those temptations was to get him to turn against God or turn against the word and to sell out, so to speak. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is is a verse for us today related to that. And I want you to look at this verse. It says, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, you're not going through anything. You're not facing anything that someone before you hasn't already faced. You haven't been singled out. You haven't been, uh, uh, you're not facing something that somebody else hasn't gone through. So you can get through this. You can do whatever you're facing. Listen, someone else has already faced it. But these next few words are key in the battle. But God is faithful. When you're going through a storm, when you're facing a temptation, when you're living in that desert place, don't forget the fact that God is faithful. He's not going to leave you there. You can always count on God. But it says, God will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. Now, let me say this. God doesn't tempt people. All right? God doesn't tempt you. God will test you, but God doesn't tempt you. To tempt you means to lead you into sin. God doesn't do that. God may test you. God may put your faith to the test. The circumstance that you're in may put your faith to the test. But anytime we pass the test, there's promotion. So God doesn't tempt you. So who will not suffer you to be tempted. It's just saying that God won't allow you to be tempted above what you are able. But the Bible says that when temptation comes, he will make a way of escape. So anytime you face a temptation, listen, God says, I will put an exit sign over your temptation. Anytime you face a temptation, God will put an exit sign. God will show you a way out if you're looking for it. Right? You've got to at least be looking for it. So God will show you a way out of your storm, a way out of your trial, a way out of your temptation so that you may be able to bear. Taylor's translation says, he will show you how to escape temptation's power. So anytime you're facing a struggle, anytime you're tempted to do something wrong, if you'll just take a breath, if you'll just take a step back, if you'll just say a prayer, if you'll look to God, he'll show you a way out of that. Amen. So let me give you very quickly, this is kind of a a mini sermon inside of a sermon. Since we're talking about temptation, because this is not taught a whole lot, I want to put this out there for you. Some steps to overcoming temptation. So hopefully you're writing some notes down. Always write things down. Bring your device. Bring your your journal. Bring your notebook. Write things down. i got some young people on the front row that are ready to take notes. God bless you guys. That's wonderful. And so always write things down. Write this down. 
Steps to overcoming temptation. Number one, don't act natural. Act supernatural. And the reason I say that is oftentimes when we go through a situation, we tend to forget that we don't just have our strength, we've got God's strength. We try to power through on our own and do it on our own, but we tend to forget the fact that the greater one lives on the inside of us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if we'll learn to unleash him and walk with him and acknowledge him, he will strengthen us physically. He'll strengthen us spiritually. He will be there in our life. When you go through a storm, don't act natural. Act supernatural. Zechariah 3, 6 says that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by his spirit. How do we overcome? By the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Second thing that I would say, number two, is this, is remember the reward in fact, this is interesting. Saul, would, King Saul, who was king when David fought Goliath, came to the truth and he said, listen, here's the deal, guys. Whoever will go out there and face this giant and fight this giant, I'm going to reward him. I'm going to reward him financially. He's never going to pay taxes again. I'm also going to give him my daughter's hand in marriage. He's going to marry into the wealthiest family in the kingdom. So there is a reward for overcoming the trial. Let me say it this way. You can focus on the price or you can focus on the prize. What's the reward for overcoming? I just made a quick list. Think about this. The reward for overcoming temptation, one is a clear conscience. So that when you lay your head down at night on your pillow, you can say, you know what, today I did the right thing. I made the right choice. You can look at the man in the mirror. Anybody ever had to have a talk to the man in the mirror? You can look at the man in the mirror and you can say, listen, two thumbs up, we made it today. Some days I don't always make it, but the days that I do, right, you can look at the man in the mirror and say, you know what? We had victory today. The reward is a blessed life. How about a closer relationship to God? Because what sin does, sin, sin just simply ruins that relationship with God. Sin pushes you away from God. But if I resist the temptation, the Bible says I can have a closer relationship with God. Spiritual maturity, an example for my children that I can live a godly life, self-respect. And then lastly, how about heaven? That's a pretty good reward, amen? The third thing is this. There's four of these. The third is take action. See, you can talk about overcoming. You can pray about overcoming. You can go to a therapy group about being an overcomer. But somewhere down the road, you've got to step out and take action and confront your giants. David had to go onto the battlefield, and it says when David got on the battlefield that he ran to meet Goliath. It was battle time, right? So there's no substitute for taking action. And the last thing is this. You have to celebrate your victories. Because when you're going through a storm and you're in the desert place, I promise you that if you look, you'll see God moving. There are victories to celebrate all along the way. Don't just focus on the things that aren't right with your life, but focus on the things that are right with your life. Sometimes we get so focused on what's not right and where my life is messed up and where my life is hard that we forget that God is good and God is faithful and that God is doing things along the way. Don't forget to count your victories. Don't forget to celebrate every victory in your life. Let me, read just, let me just remind you of Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, and this is God speaking, says, for I know the plans that I have for you. That's a personal word from God to you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. In other words, God says, listen, you have a destiny. You have a purpose. I like to say it this way. You have a purpose. You are here on purpose for a purpose. God's got a reason for you being here. So you have a destiny that God wants you to fulfill. But he says about your plan, the plan that I have for your life is good. Right? Right? The plan that I have for your life is good. There's, there's a trend that was going on and probably is still going on called repurposing. 
And that's where you go and you take something that is broken, something that has been discarded, something that, that, that is not working like it should. It's got broken down pieces. It's lost its luster. It's lost its shine. And people have just tossed it aside and said that no, it's no longer any good. But there are people of vision that can look at something like that and say, well, maybe it can no longer function in that way anymore, but I can repurpose this thing and I can turn it into something else where it again serves a purpose. And just because you've made mistakes and just because you've messed up and just because maybe your life is messed up doesn't mean that God doesn't have a purpose for you. It may not be where you started out, but God will take you right where you are and he will repurpose your life and make it something beautiful that makes a difference in someone else's life again. God loves taking broken things and repurposing them. In fact, here, here's a verse that you have to really understand this next verse to understand the purpose of the valley and how to get out of the valley, how to get out of the desert place. Mark 2, verse 22, and this is from the NIV, and it says, no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Now, almost every time when the Bible mentions wine, it always represents prosperity and the Holy Spirit. So it's synonymous, those two things. So no one pours new wine. So he's not just talking about wine into wineskins. He's using an example here. No one pours new wine into an old wineskin. Here's what a wineskin was. Shepherds wouldn't carry bottles with them. They would carry wineskins. And wineskin was when they would take a sheep, kill the sheep, and they would take the, the skin of the sheep, and again, it's a long process, but I won't, go, I won't bore you with all the details. But they would dry it out, and then they would sew the legs shut, and they would make it a container that water could be kept in there, wine could be kept in there, and one of the legs would become a spout, so to speak. So that's how they carried wine in the desert. So what would happen, though, is, is when you take, take new wine. Now, new wine, new wine has to be fermented. And if, if you put it into an old wineskin, meaning a wineskin that was dried out, it would become brittle. And when you put the new wine in, when it began the fer fermenting process, when, when it would begin to ferment, it would begin to expand on that wineskin. And, and if the wineskin was old or if the wineskin was brittle, it would break through that wineskin. It would burst and you'd lose the wineskin and the wine. Does that make sense at all? It made sense up here. I don't know if I got that out or not, but here, here's what it says. So no one pours new wine into old wine skins. It's talking about the Holy Spirit, and we are the wine skin. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. So in other words, in order for God to do something new in your life, he's going to have to expand you. He's going to have to change some things in your life. He's going to have to grow some things in your life. You, you can't put new things into someone that just wants to keep doing the same old things. You've got to be willing to say, God, I, not my will, but yours. You've got to be willing to come to a place that you say, God, whatever you want to do in my life, that's what I want. I'm willing to make the changes that will get me out of the valley, out of the desert, and to the mountaintop. Because God wants to work in you and through you. Old minds can't hold new blessings. So we have to stretch our mind to the fact that the valley leads to a blessing and realize that God is doing something here. So if your life is filled with oaths, if your life is filled with guilt, if your life is filled with condemnation or, or regrets of the pain, then you're going to have a hard time ever walking into your new season. Several years ago, I had a friend that they had just built a new house. And so Carol and I went over to see their new house, and they were real excited about it. And I don't, know if you, I don't know if you've ever built a house, but one thing I can promise you when you build a house, you always go over budget. It just happens. Count on it. It's going to happen. So he built this beautiful house, and we were so excited for them. They had their new home, and he was walking us through. They hadn't moved in yet. It was almost ready to start moving in. A few other things needed to be done, but it was mostly done. And we were walking through the house, and he said, man, I just got bad news from my wife. I said, what's the bad news? He said, he said, I just found out that tomorrow I have to go shopping for new furniture. He said, I told my wife, we, we've got furniture. And she said, no, 
I'm not moving that old stuff into my new place. I'm not moving, I'm not taking that old stuff with me. I'm going to a new place, but that stuff isn't going with me. Are you getting the picture? When God wants to begin to do a new thing in you, sometimes the old stuff, you got to leave it behind and say that stuff, although it served a purpose, it doesn't belong in my future. Those people, although they are, they are precious, they don't belong in my future. What God is going to do, I'm, I'm going to be a new wineskin. I'm not going to be the same person going to a new place. I'm going, to, I'm going to embrace the change that God is doing in my life. And so you may have to look back at some relationships. One pastor said it this way, and I love this. He said, we have wasted too much time on foolish people. If they want to be a fool, then they need to be foolish somewhere else, but not in your life. Amen. I'm not saying they're not valuable to God. I'm just saying they probably don't belong in your future. In fact, a better way is to pray for God to put people in your life who will make you better. Isn't that a great prayer? God, just put people in my life that will make me better, that will challenge me, that will comfort me, a father that will help guide me. Sometimes God will put heavenly sandpaper in your life. People that just rub off the rough edges, you know, but sometimes they're from God. So pray for God to put people in your life that will make you better and watch your life get better. Don't move your old regrets into your new place. All of those things that have held you back, all of those things that have been obstacles, all of those thoughts, all of those memories, all of those hurts, there are some people that have been carrying the same problems for 30 years. Same hurts, same excuses. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'm going to tell you something. You ain't getting any younger. And I will add to that, you're not as young as you used to be. Don't waste any more time with defeated thinking and hurts from the past. It's time to make your life count. Pastor, I've had a lot of raw deals. Life's not fair. You're right. In fact, I, I think every birth certificate, whenever a baby is born, I think on their birth certificate, right next to their name, they need to print in large, bold print, life's not fair. Just so you know, we, now you're coming to the world, just so you know, life's not fair. So there are things that we walk through as we go through the valleys that we're facing, as we go through the struggles that we're facing. But God never intended for you to stay in the valley. It's a journey. The destination is the mountaintop. But we've got to decide along the way, what do I need to let go of? I want you to stand with me this morning. Now, I'm going to go ahead and invite our prayer team that they would come to the front because they're going to be here available to pray with you this morning. And there's some things I'm going to ask you to pray about, but I think it's important that we have people in our life that will agree with us in prayer concerning our situation. And so maybe this morning, as we begin to talk about this, and we're going to worship with a great course here in just a moment, but maybe as we begin to talk about this, and you realize there, there are some things that you need to bring, and you need to just lay them down. You've been dragging around regrets and hurts, broken things in your life. If there are people that are here this morning that will help you to pray to just lay those things down. Wouldn't it be wonderful to just walk out this morning and say, you know what, I'm free from that. I'm free from those thoughts. I'm free from that action. I'm free from those things in my life that have held me back. And God, I'm just going to let those things go. There's some things that I need to leave behind. Or maybe this morning you need to ask somebody to agree with you that God would just give you strength. Don't ever give up too early. Don't act natural, act supernatural. Because it's not just your strength that you have. 
When two of you shall agree together on earth as touching anything, it will be done for them. See, there's some things I can do in my own faith, but then there are times that I need to involve somebody in my life. And I need them to pray the prayer of agreement with me. And I, didn't, I need them to join their faith to my faith. I need them to link their shield of faith to my shield of faith. And I need to know that they are praying for me. One of the first churches, in fact, it was the church where I met Carol in many, many years ago. Well, not that many, a few years ago. Okay. She said I had one too many in there. There's a, there a little old lady in that church named Aetha May. And whatever, whatever, whatever picture that name conjures up in your mind, you're probably right, that was her, Aetha May. She was like 100 years old or something, I don't know. But she cleaned the church. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman of God. And I would see her on a daily basis because I was always bumping into her in the halls, in the classrooms, in the sanctuary. She was always inside or outside doing something around. She was always, she worked at the church all the time. And we'd always have conversations. But I'm telling you, she was a woman of faith. And I know that when I hit a problem and I hit a wall and I didn't know what to do, I would go looking for Aetha May. And I would say, I want you to pray for me. Because I knew she had power in prayer that I didn't have. But if I could hook my faith with hers, we could get things done. So this morning, whatever your need is that you have, that if you're in that valley place, if it's strength, if it's laying some things down, and I cannot tell you how liberating that is, I cannot tell you that some of you, maybe the greatest thing you need to do is just say, God, I, I just give these things to you. Cast all of your care on Him because He cares for you. So this morning, if that describes you, then would you just step out from where you are as we begin to worship at this course? Would you come into our prayer partners and let's close this morning, this afternoon with a time of prayer together. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for the service today. I really hope that it was a blessing to you because I know you guys are a blessing to us. If you'd like to follow us on YouTube, there's a link below that you can find that. Also, if you need prayer, you can text the number that's below and we'd be glad to pray for you and pray with you. If you wanna consider about joining us financially and contributing to what we're doing here, you can also find that link below as well. Look forward to seeing you next week. We love you guys.